sunshine I need to laugh And when the sun is out I've got something I can laugh about I feel good in a special way I'm in love and it's a sunny day Good day sunshine Good day sunshine Good day sunshine We take a walk The sun is shining down Burns my feet as they touch the ground Good day sunshine Good day sunshine Good day sunshine Then we lie beneath the shady tree She knows she's looking fine I'm so proud to know that she is mine Good day sunshine 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 If I fell in love with you, would you promise to be true and help me understand? Cause I've been in love before and I found that love was more than just holding hands. If I give my heart to you, I must be 
show from the very start that you would love me more than her. If I trust in you, oh please don't run and hide if I love you too. Oh please don't hurt my pride like her. Cause I couldn't stand the pain and I would be sad if I in vain so I hope you see that I would love to love you and that she will cry when she learns we are two cause I couldn't stand the pain and I would be sad if
Now somewhere in the black mining hills of Dakota There lived a young boy named Rocky Raccoon And one day his woman ran off with another guy Hit young Rocky in the eye Rocky didn't like that He said, I'm gonna get that boy So one day he walked into town Booked himself a room in the local saloon Rocky Raccoon Checked into his room Only to find Gideon's Bible Rocky had come Equipped with a gun To shoot off the legs of his rival His rival, it seems Had broken his dreams By stealing the girl of his fancy Her name was McGill And she called herself Lil But everyone Now she and her man, who called himself Dan, were in the next room at the hoedown. A rocky burst in, and grinning a grin, he said, Danny boy, this is a showdown. But Daniel was hot, he drew fast and sharp. And Rocky collapsed in the corner your match and Rocky said Doc it's only a scratch and I'll be better I'll be better Doc as soon as I am able and now Rocky Raccoon he fell back in his room only to find Gideon's Bible Gideon checked out and he left Okay. With Siggy in mouth. Let's all get up and let's all get up and dance to a song that was a hit before your mother was born. Though she was born a should know Sing it again Let's all get up and dance to a song that was a hit before your mother was born Though she was born a long, long time ago Your mother should know Your mother should know Sing me a song that was a hit Before your mother was born Though she was born a long, long time ago Your mother should know Your mother should know Your mother should know Your mother 
should know should fade out at the end anyway, so there was enough to fade out. Was that all right? Welcome to a very special episode of Rugged Radio. Today we'll be going over how the Beatles came together in 1960, and also how the Beatles broke up 10 years later in 1970. Now usually on the radio, you know, you hear that, you got, they got a front sell and back sell a song, you know? You usually hear them saying, that was blah 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 by the Beatles, and before that we had blah 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 by the Beatles. Coming up in just a bit, we've got Blah 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 by The Banals. Right here on Blah Blah C K G B A B C D F K B L G A L Blah 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 Suck My Balls FM. It's the same shit over and over again, you know, it's the same format. I try and stay away from that shit, you know, I try and keep it fresh. So instead of, it's going to be annoying. Like I got 29 songs coming up, so instead of naming them all one by one as I play them, I figure I'm just, let's just get it all out of the way right now. You know, let's just get it out of the way. Here are the 29 songs you can hear on this episode by the Beatles. Three Cool Cats, Love Me Do, Twist and Shout, You've Gotta Hide Your Love Away, Do You Want to Know a Secret, I Want to Hold Your Hand, All of My Loving, Hold Me Tight, Eight Days a Week, I've Just Seen a Face, I'm Only Sleeping, I'm So Tired, We Can Work It Out, Girl, Loosing the Sky with Diamonds, Glass Onion, Come Together, I Am the Walrus, Hey Bulldog, Happiness is a Warm Gun, Helter Skelter, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, with a little help from my friends, being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band Reprise, Don't Let Me Down, Get Back, I've Got a Feeling, Oh Darling, Let It Be, and finally, In My Life. So sit back, relax, you know, I've jammed a lot of Beatles music into this. We also have funny interviews, plus session recording bloopers, and also... Paul McCartney gives an intimate one-on-one interview on the Beatles' breakup and how it all went down. That's coming up right here on Rugged Radio. Up above, I think cool cats really 
The Beatles, one of the most popular bands ever known, formed in Liverpool, England in 1960. But they didn't start off as the Beatles. At first, there were three young guitarists that went by the group name Johnny and the Moondogs. It was founded by John Lennon and two of his schoolmates in 1959. John was 20 years old at that time. By then, he had met 18-year-old Paul McCartney, who joined the band shortly after. Paul replaced an existing member of the band. Then Paul introduced John to George Harrison. Now at the time, George was a young kid at the age of 14, so John didn't have much faith in them. But over time, George proved his worth. George replaced the other band member, so now they had three decent guitarists. All they needed now was to find a drummer. In February 1962, they took their manager's suggestion to change the name of the band to The Beatles, spelled B-E-A-T-A-L-S, Beatles, as a tribute to the late Buddy Holly in the Crickets. They decided to use that name until May, when they changed their name to The Silver Beatles. They kept that name for three months before finally changing it back to just The Beatles. In August, they found the right drummer for the job, an eager drummer named Ringo Starr at the age of 22. On September 4th, 1962, their manager flew the four of them from Liverpool down to London to have their first recording session ever as The Beatles. The four of them sat down and recorded hours of music on end. They got some great music out of it. One song that came out of it turned out to be their first hit single, which launched them into popularity leading them to begin their British invasion on American pop music, starting off with their first hit, Love Me Do.
Late October, the Beatles were beginning their five-day tour of Sweden. On the return back to London, several hundred screaming fans greeted them in the heavy rain pour at the local airport. They waited for hours in the rain, long before the Beatles' plane even landed. 
There were also roughly about 100 journalists and photographers that also joined the airport reception. In mid-November, as Beetle mania started to intensify, police had resorted to using high-pressured water hoses to control the wild screaming fans. Sometimes they had to use hoses on the crowds before the show could even start. By 1963, I Want to Hold Your Hand sold a million copies, becoming a number one hit in the U.S. That I'm missing the lips I am missing And hope that my dreams will come true And then while I'm away I'll ride home every day And I'll send all my loving to you All my loving Yeah, 
And uh, tell me, you brought three of your friends. Could you please introduce them? Yes, there's them? George Parasol, <coughs> Ringo Stone, and Paul Macharmley. It feels so right, come I'll try to remember, John, and if I don't, well, it's just too bad in t- t- One, but hold on. One, two, three. Ooh. Oh, no, that's too much. You're daft, yes. Oh, it's one of the four of them. One, two, three, four. Ooh.
What are you doing? It's, I, it's murder. I can't do it. Can't keep it up. I'm just going. Shh, ready. Shh. Ringo, keep your bit dead. Ringo! We're taping. You made a mistake. I know you did. It's a love that lasts forever. A wop babaloo babo. It's a love that has no end. Babaloo, it's a don't let me down. Don't let me down. I'll try to remember, John, and if I don't, well, it's just too bad, in it? You're daft, yeah. I was on a... George, what did it sound like with the bass doing a funny thing? Did it sound any good or did it sound just a like lovely crap? The, 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 the light's on. I know it is. Huh? So. And don't slow down, for Christ's sake. Let's keep it Or I'm giving you no more drugs. Been for a shit, I see, Megan. <laughs> I've just seen a face I can't forget the time or place where we just met She's just a girl for me and I want all the world to see we've met mm -hmm. Had it been another day I might have looked the other way And I'd have never been aware But as it is I'll dream of her tonight da, 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 da. Falling, yes I am falling And she keeps calling back again I have never known the like of this I've been alone and I have missed things and kept out of sight but other girls were never quite like this but I'm da, 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 da. falling yes I'm falling and she keeps calling me back again seen a face I can't forget the time or place where we just met she's just a girl for me and I want all the world to see we've met mm -hmm, da, da, da. falling yes I'm falling and she keeps calling me back again falling yes I'm falling and she keeps calling me back again On February 7, 1964, the Beatles left Britain to come back to the United States. Upon landing at New York's John F. Kennedy Airport, a roaring crowd the size of 3,000 people all greeted them this time. They made their first live U.S. television debut two days later on The Ed Sullivan Show. Approximately 73 million people all watched from their homes. That's about 34% of the American population at that time. It was the largest audience that had ever been recorded for a live television show in U.S. history. Within two months, the Beatles pulled off 37 shows in only 27 days, traveling from country to country through places like Denmark, the Netherlands, Hong Kong, Australia, and New Zealand. The tour dates kept growing and expanding. In August 1964, journalist Al Aronowitz arranged for the Beatles to meet Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan drove out to their hotel in New York, where the Beatles were staying. He visited them in their hotel room and brought along his guitar so they could play music together. Dylan introduced them to marijuana. When they both met, this was seen as making two worlds collide. They both had very different fan bases. You had Dylan's audience of college kids with artistic and intellectual traits, with an interest in politics and social idealism. They had a very laid-back, bohemian way about them, which was now mixed in with all the Beatles fans, which were young, teeny boppers, you know? Kids in high school or grade school, kids who were totally caught up in the commercialism and the pop culture of television, uh, the radio, pop records, fan magazines, teen fashion, all that shit. 
They were seen as idolizers, not idealists. Bob Dylan and the Beatles managed to exchange each other's fan base. Both completely different types of groups were now starting to mash together into one. During the release of Beatles for Sale in 1964, the band had run out of songs to release. Constantly being on the road made it hard for the band to write music. They were running out of love songs. The whole teenage boys in love image was slowly starting to die. John Lennon admitted during an interview that material for writing these love songs is becoming one hell of a problem. He wasn't sure what they were going to do. I'm so tired I hadn't slept a wink I'm so Sleep. I can't stop my brain, you know it's three weeks I'm going insane, you know I'd give you everything I've got for a little peace of mind I'm so tired, I'm feeling so upset Although I'm so tired, I'll have another cigarette And curse a Walter rally. He was such a stupid get You'd say I'm putting you on But it's no joke It's doing me harm You know I can't sleep I can't stop my brain You know it's three weeks I'm going insane I'd give you everything I've got For little peace of mind Give you everything I've got For little peace of mind
have to keep on talking till I can go on While you see it your way But the risk of knowing that our love may soon be gone We can work it out We can work it out Think of what you're saying You can get it wrong and still you think that it's alright Think of what I'm saying We can work it out and get it straight or say goodnight That we might fall apart before too long We can work it out We can work it out Life is very short And there's no time For fussing and fighting, my friend Chance that we might fall apart before too long. We can work it out. We can work it out. Is there anybody going to listen to my story? All about the girl who came to stay. She's the kind of girl you want so much it makes you sorry. Still you don't regret a single day Ah, girl Girl, girl When I think of all the times I've tried so hard to leave her She will turn to me and start to cry And she promises the earth to me and I believe her After all this time, I don't know why Ah, girl Girl, girl She's the kind of girl who put you down When friends are there, you feel a fool When you say she's looking good She acts as if it's understood she's cool Ooh, 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 girl Girl, girl Was she told when she was young That pain would lead to pleasure Did she understand it when they said That a man must break his back She still believe it when he's dead The Beatles started entering their mind-expanding psychedelic phase from 1965 to 1967, with albums like Rubber Soul, Revolver, and Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. In early 1965, John Lennon and George Harrison were both invited to a couple's dinner. It was hosted by their mutual local dentist. Him and his girlfriend hosted both couples for a lovely evening of music and wine over dinner. 
After the dinner, the dentist went into the kitchen to fix up a cup of coffee for everyone. He secretly added LSD into the coffee and served it to everyone without telling them. Lennon described the experience as saying, It was terrifying, yet it was fantastic. I was pretty stunned for about a month or two afterwards. Heavy stuff, man. Heavy stuff. Here's a clip of him talking about his first experience on acid with George and his dentist. Uh, a dentist in London <laughs> put it, laid it on George, me, and our wives without telling us at a dinner party at his house. He was a friend of George's. And he just put it in our coffee or something, you know. I mean, it, this was a dinner and we got out and went, went and this guy came with us. He was nervous. He didn't know what was going, what we were going crackers, you know. <laughs> I mean, we did, it was insane going around London on it. And we thought when we went to the club, we thought it was on fire. And then we thought it was a premiere. Oh, no, we thought it was a premiere. It was just an ordinary light outside. We thought, shit, what's going on here, you know. And we were cackling in the street and then, you know, people were shouting. Shouting, let's break a window. You know, we were just insane. I mean, we just had our heads and people had come up to me. And we finally got, we got in the lift and we all thought there was a fire in the lift. It was just a little red light. And we were all screaming like that. And it erupted all hysterical. And we all arrived on the floor because this was a discotheque that was up a building, you know. We get, and the lift stops and the door opens and we're all going, ah! And we just see that it's the club. And then we walk in, you know, sit down and we're, it's like that. Oh, oh, oh. You know, and the tables elongate, you know. I think we went to eat before that, and it was like in the thing I'd read about opium, where the table suddenly... I suddenly realised that it was only a table like this, there was four of us around, but it went this long. And I thought, fuck, it's happening, you know. Some oh. singer came up to me and said, can I sit next to you? And I was like, only if you don't talk! You know, like, because <laughs> I was, just couldn't think. John and George became regular users of the drug, joined by Ringo at least once or twice on a group trip. At first, Paul was against trying it, but eventually he tried it two years later in 1966. He became the first member of the Beatles to discuss LSD publicly, declaring in a magazine interview that it opened up his eyes and made him a better, more honest, more tolerant member of society. Here's Paul's famous interview discussing acid. Have you taken LSD? About four times. And where did you get it from? Oh, you know, I mean, if I was to say where I got it from, you know, it's illegal and everything, it's silly to say that. Don't you believe that this was a, a matter which you should have kept private? Mm, but the thing is, you know, that I was asked a question by a newspaper, and the decision was whether to tell a lie or to uh, tell him the truth, you know. I decided to tell him the truth, but I, I really didn't want to say anything, you know, because if I had my decision, uh, you know, if I had it my way, I wouldn't have told anyone, you know, because I'm not trying to spread the word about this. But the man from the newspaper is the man from the mass medium, you know. I'll keep it a personal thing. If he does too, you know, if he keeps it quiet. But he wanted to spread it, so it's his responsibility, you know, for spreading it, not mine. But you're a public figure and you said it in the first place and you must have known that it would, made, would have made the newspapers. Yes, but to say it, you know, is only to tell the truth. I, I'm telling the truth, you know. I don't know what everyone's so angry about. Well, do you think you have now encouraged your fans to take drugs? I don't think it'll make any difference, you know. I don't think my fans are going to take drugs just because I did, you know. But the thing is, that that's not the point anyway, you know. I was asked whether I had or not. And then from then on, the whole bit about how far it's going to go and how many people it's going to encourage is up to the newspapers and up to you, you know, on television. I mean, you're spreading this now at this moment. This is going into all the homes, you know, in Britain. And I'd rather it didn't, you know. But you're asking me the question. You want me to be honest. I'll be honest, you know. But as a public figure, surely you've got a responsibility to lots and no, lots of No, it's you've got the responsibility. You've got the responsibility not to spread this now. You know, I'm quite prepared to keep it as a very personal thing, if you will too. If you'll shut up about it, I will. About a year and a half ago, and there were quotes on the wire about uh, oh, your discussion of LSD and uh, some other things, narcotics. <sighs> yes, uh, Larry. It seemed to me from what I read that you had endorsed it and uh, condemned we it. We were manufacturing it. Tangerine trees and marmalade skies Somebody calls you, you answer quite slowly A girl with colliders go by
people eat marshmallow pies Everyone smiles as you drift past the flowers that grow so incredibly high Newspaper taxis appear on the shore Waiting to take you Train in a station with plasticine porters with looking glass ties. Suddenly someone is there at the turnstile, the girl with kaleidoscope eyes. Joker! 
the album Rubber Soul had a huge impact on changing the Beatles' image. The hippie phase. Their hair got longer and their lyrics became more complex, their music more unique, using orchestras of up to 40 people at times, and copious amounts of illegal drugs. Their reach was beginning to expand as they embraced deeper aspects of romance and philosophy. Many people believe the new musical direction of the Beatles was from their habitual use of marijuana, a statement which was confirmed by the band themselves. John Lennon referred to Rubber Soul as the pot album. Ringo Starr was quoted as saying, Grass was really influential in a lot of the changes, especially with the writers. And because Lennon and McCartney were writing different material, Harrison and I now had to play differently as we aged. Harrison began using a sitar, which helped move their progression outside the traditional boundaries of modern pop music. As their lyrics became more artful, fans began to study them for a deeper meaning. When it came to Norwegian Wood, John commented saying, I was trying to be sophisticated by writing about a love affair I once had, but in such a smokescreen way that you couldn't really tell. John Lennon received a letter from a student in 1967. It was a young student that went to the same high school that John used to go to when he was younger. He told John in his letter that there was a certain teacher that was making the whole class analyze every single Beatles song for assignments and homework. John read this and was instantly amused. John thought to himself, I'm going to write the most messed up, complicated song ever. He was with a childhood friend when he wrote the song. His friend Peter Schotten joked around and told him he should throw in some stuff from their old childhood nursery rhymes. An example of that would be custard dripping from a dead dog's eye. John was quoted to have wrote the song in only a couple of hours, over some drinks with Peter at the local pub. After he finished writing the song, he leaned back in his chair and looked down at the piece of paper with a smile. It was a song called I Am The Walrus. He reread the lyrics one more time before laughing and telling Peter, There, let the fuckers try and work that one out. Sitting in an English garden waiting for the sun If the sun goes 
Mother Superior jumped the gun. Mother Superior jumped the gun.
When the Beatles returned back home to London, they sat down for an interview with the London Evening Standard, a free newspaper that was delivered to all the homes in London, back when they had both morning and evening newspapers. It was conducted by an interviewer named Maureen Cleave. Cleave sat down with all four band members. At one point, John Lennon said the following quote, Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. I needn't argue with that. I'm right and I will be proved right. We're more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. Jesus was all right, but his disciples were thick and ordinary. It's them twisting it around that ruined it for me. The comment that John made went by completely unnoticed by England. Not a single word of it was ever mentioned. Five months later, it got put into print in an American pop magazine called Datebook. All hell broke loose. It sparked a controversy with the Christians in the American Bible Belt. The Vatican issued a protest. The Catholic people all gathered up and rallied outside the concert halls of each of their shows, burning their records in giant local bonfires. There was also a strict ban on Beatles records imposed by Spanish and Dutch radio stations, and also on South Africa's national broadcasting service as well. Here's what happened. I mean, early in 1966, John gave an interview to Maureen Cleave, in which he made a chance remark saying, we are, the Beatles are more popular than Jesus Christ. If it had said, we're more, uh, television is more popular than Jesus, I might have got away with it. <laughs> you know, but as I just happened to be talking to a friend, I used the word Beatles as a remote thing, not as what I think, as Beatles as though those other Beatles like other people see us. I just said, they are, are having more, in, more influence on kids and things than anything else, including Jesus. But I said it in that way. I was pointing out that fact in reference to England, that we meant more to kids than Jesus did, or religion at that time. I wasn't knocking it or putting it down, I was just saying it. But I'm not saying that we're better or greater or comparing us with Jesus Christ as a person or God as a thing or whatever it is. You know, I just said what I said and it was wrong or was taken wrong and now it's all this. This is Doug Layton and Tommy Charles We're reminding you that our fantastic Beatle boycott is still in effect. We have not forgotten what the Beatles said. The Beatles made a statement in all the newspapers that they're getting more better than uh, Jesus himself. I think simply uh, on the basis of statistics and fact, uh, his statement is untrue. Well, no one is more popular than Jesus. I just didn't mean what everybody thinks I meant, you know. I'm not anti-Christ or anti-religion or anti-God, you know. So many people have built buildings in the name of Christ. And what have people done for the Beatles? What have they done for us? We urge you to take your Beatle records, pictures, and souvenirs to the pickup points about to be named. And on the night of the Beatles' appearance in Memphis, August 19th, they will be destroyed in a huge public bonfire at a place to be named soon. Nobody told me there'd be days like these. Nobody told me there'd be days like these. Nobody told me there'd be days like these. Strange days indeed. Most peculiar, Mama. Roll. It doesn't matter about people not liking our records or not liking the way they look or what we say. You know, they're entitled to not like us. And we're entitled not to have anything to do with them if we don't want to, or not to regard them. You know, we've all got our rights. The Beatles were even being protested and picketed by the Ku Klux Klan. Here's an audio clip from an actual KKK member. The Beatles made a statement in all the newspapers that they're getting more better than uh, Jesus himself. And the Ku Klux Klan, being a religious order, is going to come out here the night that they appear at the Colosseum here. And we're going to demonstrate with uh, different ways and tactics to stop this performance. The Klan is going to come out here because we're the only organization that will come out and make a stop to these accusations. This is nothing but blasphemy. And we're going to try to stop it any terror way we can, but it's going to stop. We're known as a terror organization. I think we have, a terror organization? We have ways and means to stop this if uh, this is going to be the case, yes. Well, what, uh, what ways and means? Well, I don't want to say this, but uh, there'll be a lot of surprises uh, Monday night, I believe, when they get here. Rubber Soul was a major step forward. It paved the way for the release of their next album, Revolver. The album was released on August 5th, 1966. This album came out a week before the Beatles went on tour together. This time, sadly, it would turn out to be the final tour that the Beatles ever went on. The Beatles held their final concert at Candlestick Park in San Francisco. It marked the end of a four-year period dominated by non-stop touring. 
The Beatles managed to perform over 1,400 concerts internationally in just four years. Think about that. That's playing 350 concerts a year, 30 concerts a month, seven to eight shows a week. When you think about flying back and forth between all those countries, they really did work eight days a week. Jesus Christ. Now that the Beatles were free from constantly being on tour, they now had a lot of time on their hands to embrace the weird experimental stuff that would be used in the recordings for Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. What that really meant was now they had a lot of time to do drugs, relax, and play around with recording equipment and see what kind of weird stuff they could discover. According to the album's engineer, Jeff Emmerich, the album's recording took over 700 hours of recorded tape. He recalled the Beatles insisting that everything had to be different on the Sgt. Pepper's album. We would stick microphones into the wide openings of trumpets. We had headphones that we turned into microphones, and then we attached those to violins. We used giant primitive oscillators to vary the speed of the instruments and vocals. And we also had tapes that we would chop up into pieces. We would stick these pieces of audio tape back together in random order. We would sometimes flip the pieces upside down and the wrong way around until we had this brand new disturbed sounding audio reel. It took a lot of precise randomness to make it sound a certain way. But the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band turned out exactly the way they wanted it to. We were all very proud of it in the end, claimed Emmerich. Do I do when my love 
is there, what a scene Over men and horses, hoops and garters Lastly through a hogshead of real fire In this way, Mr. K will challenge the world The celebrated Mr. K performs his feet on Saturday at Bishop's Gate The Hendersons will dance and sing As Mr. Kite flies through the ring Don't be late Let us K and H assure the public Their production will be second to none And of course Henry the Horse dances the waltz The Beatles decided to take a trip to India to write music and learn how to meditate and become more spiritual in their lives. They turned to Maharishi, a spiritual guide on a peaceful retreat in India. He took the band in for three months to recuperate and get away from all the fans and paparazzi and all the craziness. Their spiritual leader turned out to be a fraud who was using the Beatles' fame to attract young women to his holy camp. Eventually they found out he was using the Beatles to get free pussy. That's when they packed up their shit and left. The Beatles returned to the States afterwards to work on two more albums, The White Album and Let It Be. That's when the band was starting to fall apart. George Harrison wasn't even showing up for studio recordings anymore. Ringo Starr wasn't returning phone calls. John Lennon was slowly starting to care less about the Beatles' music too. They began recording sessions for The White Album, which was from May to mid-October in 1968. By then, the relationship between each of the Beatles had grown very thin. Ringo Starr quit the Beatles for two weeks even, and Paul McCartney had to take over doing the drumming on Back in the USSR, as well as singing and guitar. John and Paul also stopped writing songs together, too. While John was coming up with songs like Dear Prudence, McCartney was coming out with Oubladi Oublada, a song that John Lennon once angrily referred to as, that stuff is granny music shit. Tensions were also rising with John's new romantic lover, an avant-garde artist, Yoko Ono. John insisted on bringing her to the session recordings. 
even though the band had established from day one that either girlfriends or wives were not allowed in the recording studio. And now John was breaking that rule, and the band members did not like it. Later, John mentioned in an interview that every track on the White Album is an individual track. There isn't any Beatles music on it. It's either John in the band, or it's Paul in the band, or it's George in the band. They all knew deep down that this was the start to the band's breakup. She does. Ooh, she does. Yes, she does. And if somebody loved me like she does, ooh, she does. Yes, she does. first time Don't you know it's gonna last It's a love that lasts forever It's a love that has no past Don't let me down Don't let She really does me Oh, she does me She does me good I guess nobody ever really does me Oh, she does me She does me good
following is how the Beatles broke up on December 31st, 1970. They all filed a suit for the dissolution of the Beatles' contract, ownership, and partnership, completely shattering everything that was left of the Beatles. Here is a deeply intimate one-on-one -on -one interview with Paul McCartney on the painful breakup of the Beatles. Take a listen. At the actual break of the Beatles, it was painful. And, uh, I mean, we likened it to, like, a divorce. Um, that, you know, these people have been together since they were school kids together. Had finally broken up, and it wasn't exactly amicable. There was a lot of business differences and a lot of money involved. Now it's 20 years later, and now when I look at those songs, I don't think of any of the pain associated with that time. John said um, he didn't miss the Beatles after the breakup. Did yeah, well, I you, think that... Do you? Yeah, I think John said a lot of things that he didn't necessarily mean. John was that kind of guy. Uh, he's a great guy, but um, he also said the Beatles were bastards, and he didn't miss the Beatles. It's... John was a lot of bravado involved in what John said. You don't believe that he missed them? I don't that. believe it. Not for one tiny second. I know for a fact he missed them. He talked to Yoko and she says, yeah, he missed them. I, I talked to him on the phone. He said, you could tell he missed them, but John was not the kind of guy. You know, he's like, um, How about he's the kind of guy you'd thump in the mouth. He said, did that hurt? He said, no. And you knew it hurt. How about you? Not that I ever did thump him in the mouth. You about me even now, um, even now yeah i mean i think the point is you know that the beatles was a great band uh, we came out of liverpool together we did a lot of great things together and um so i think there was a point when we missed them uh, and i think that was shortly after the breakup maybe the first five years after the breakup um after that i think uh, john would start to be right you know that we'd miss them less and less as we each formed our new lives it is a bit like leaving the army you know mm -hmm. they said you kind of then you go get married you have kids i think all of us recognized that there had to be a life after the beatles about the breakup how did how did it happen um we'd been together like 10 years and and during the making of the white album things started to get a little bit edgy um in fact during the making of sergeant pepper george hadn't showed for most of the album which was unusual as we normally showed for our recording mm -hmm. sessions <laughs> george hadn't been too interested in making that album i think he was building a swimming pool and it was just all a little bit like that. And of course, I was sort of thinking, you know, thought, well, I won't say anything, but it's a bit dodgy. We went on to make the White Album, and um, things really did start to kind of disintegrate a little bit. And eventually, when Alan Klein came in, <clears throat> I think he was the kind of the final straw. He got a meeting with John and Yoko the night before we were due to have a big sort of State of the Nation meeting. And John and Yoko arrived the next day, and they, uh, John issued a statement saying, Every, all my affairs are now in the hands of Alan Klein. Everything I do must go through him. Um, and we were due to sign a deal with Capitol Records, which was what we were all there for this meeting. And Klein apparently had said to John, look, don't say anything. John had expressed his desire to, like, leave the group. And Klein, being a businessman, had said, don't say anything till after they've signed the capital, the new capital deal, which he was involved with. I'd been arguing for weeks about his percentage and stuff. I figured we were a big act. We could give him 15%. The others were saying, no, he, he's got to have 20. I said, we're big act, guys. Real big group. He'll take 15. Don't you worry. They said, no way. Anyway, so um, John I was at that meeting, and he just suddenly let it out. He just looked at us all. We were sitting around like this, and John just said, I wasn't going to tell you until after you signed the capital deal. He said, but I'm leaving the group. And he just looked at us, and our jaws just fell. And we all went kind of white. And he said, uh, 
He said, it's kind of a great feeling, telling you. It's kind of an adrenaline rush. He said, it's like, you know, men telling someone you're getting divorced. He said, it's kind of, you know, a little bit weird, but I'm leaving the group. So we all kind of just said, sort of, uh... like about three or four months and um, nothing happened he was obviously not going to come back to the group he was enjoying his newfound freedom so we all decided that uh, that was it and I, will sing a I decided that it was time to tell the world rather than just keep pretending we were still a group when, when we weren't for four months and I let it out in a statement with um, an album I put out called McCartney in fact, John got annoyed with me. He said, I wanted to tell. I said, well, tough, you know. And my overwhelming feeling was like, I'm of no use anymore. My usefulness is gone. Really? Yeah. You know, I, I just, um, what, what's my use? What do I do now? What, what am I? You were one of the Beatles. And the but Beatles it, didn't exist it's anymore. It's like, yeah, you know, you were one of the Beatles. That was the, like the frightening bit. You once were. And I kind of said, well, God, you know, I'm not like at retirement age yet. I can't just swan off to a desert mm -hmm. island. Yeah, I've got to do something. So the, the just the kind of depression of actually trying to think what I would do next, you know. And my self-esteem was what was, was the thing that I think the guys who get laid off, it's what they feel. You just plummet. You just get so depressed. Did you yeah, really? I mean, that was the worst moment other than my mother dying when I was 14. That was the kind of second worst moment in my life to that point. I mean, I didn't, I didn't get up for a long time. I didn't shave for a long time. I, I drank a little. Hey, what the hell? Yo, let's go for it. We got time off, guys. Why shave? No one's coming round. I, mean, I don't serious? have to go out. Oh yeah, it was, I mean, it, was serious, right. it was serious to your fans, obviously. I mean, I mean, well, it was more thought... serious to my family. You know, I mean, the fans is one thing. You know, I, we'd given them ten years of, of good music at least, but the current situation with the young family, as I had, you know, mm -hmm. Linda, I don't, we don't even. But you weren't worried about <laughs> making ends meet. You weren't worried about. No, that. It, it wasn't that. It's just self-esteem. It's yeah. not having money. Yeah. It took me quite a lot of time, and Linda was like a major help with that. She kind of lifted me back up and I eventually started to think well you know maybe it's not the end of the world but it took a couple of months and the, the difficult thing for me um, that an, an ordinary guy being laid off would encounter was people like yourself would sort of say to me uh, once I was trying to make a return to the world you know and start doing interviews as kind of you quote your ex beetle the worst question I really feared was they'd say Paul are you happy and I go <laughs> yes <laughs> You know, and you felt you were going to break down, mm -hmm. lying through your teeth. You weren't happy at all, you know. So it was, it was, uh, it was really tough, folks. You were, uh, and here's where the violins come in. I never give you my I send you my I gradually kind of clawed my way back up, got wings together, which was like a very difficult thing, because it was like, how are you going to follow an act right. like the Beatles? Right. I thought, well, you just follow it, that's all. You won't follow it as well. You, but you'll do something. You'll do something. Consequently, every success we ever had with wings, and there were many, was totally overshadowed by the Beatles. And uh, since the Beatles, I have outsold Beatle records and stuff. So, I mean, I've... You, you can you look at those moments and think, well, you know, so there is life after Beatles. When I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. Darkness, she is standing right in front of me, 
speaking words of wisdom, let it be. After their breakup in 1970, they each enjoyed successful solo careers of their own. And to this day, Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr are the two surviving members that still remain alive. John Lennon was shot and killed 10 years after the breakup in December 1980. George Harrison was also murdered by lung cancer in November 2001. There are places But people are 
Well, that song means we've reached the end of our show. Next week, we'll be covering the story on how John Lennon got shot and who shot him. We'll also be playing many great songs of his solo career. That's all coming up next week right here on Rugged Radio. Until then, people, take care and have a good night. Good night, everybody. That's a wrap. Good night, everybody. And I'll never, ever leave you to dream alone again. Good night, we dream. Good The superior jump. Oh shit. Wrong chord. Okay. Hold on, hold on. I was out. Now I'm just gonna raise this so as it's nearer the bass strings than the top string. Paul's broken at last, broken at last, Paul's broken at last, at last, at last he's broke today. Okay. One oh, are you ready? Macca. Do you want us to do it again, George? Okay. With Siggy in mouth. <laughs>